to another episode of Project SAFE, Seniors Against Financial Exploitation. It is estimated that 25 to $30 billion a year is taken from seniors and retirees throughout the country through various forms of scam. Within the town of North Hempstead, there's approximately 50,000 retirees and 20,000, excuse me, 50,000 seniors and 20,000 retirees who are lucky enough to have retired before the age of 60. Over the next 12 months, months it is estimated that 10% of them will be scammed. This goes on at, oh, every year, and what our attempt here to do with Project Safe is to bring to you the tools necessary to help you safeguard your money and your family. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Dave Mejias, who is an attorney specializing in divorce. And within the town of North Hempstead, actually within Nassau County, because Dave practices all over, we are not cognizant of the fraud and the scams that can happen within that industry. Dave, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. And there's something I forget every time when I'm introducing you. I'm John Ryan, and my partner, Peter Janowski, are the co-hosts of this program. Now, Dave. Thanks for having me on. No, it's a pleasure. We always start with the same question. How did you get involved in law? You know, it's a, it's a, I'll try to give you the short story, yeah, but, um, you know, my parents were immigrants. My father came from Cuba. My mother came from Ecuador. They met in an English class for adults at Hempstead. Okay. And, uh, you know, very working class background. And my father, unfortunately, was killed in a car accident when I was 13. Oh. And we had no life insurance. We had nothing. So we filed a lawsuit. And my little sister and I, who's now a judge, uh, both testified at the hearing. And we were able to see firsthand how the legal system could provide justice for people that can't get justice for themselves. And that wow. fascinated me. And for me to be able to do that for other people in my life and as a career has been a blessing. That's a wonderful story. My God, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, that's, and, and when, we, when you have these programs, someone like you owns your job. That's it. You didn't yeah. say, oh, I'll make a few dollars, let me become a lawyer. You're no. doing this because it's you personal. were called. You know, 100%, you were called to this. It's, a very, it's very personal for me. And, you know, and I, I take it very seriously when we have people that come to us with family law issues. You know, I'm primarily a family lawyer, and that's the most important thing in your life is your family right. and your kids mm -hmm. and what's going to happen going forward in case you get divorced or, you know, what's going to happen with your grandkids if you want to help them when they're getting married and give them a gift so they can buy a house. How do you protect them and right. the money that you're giving them uh, in case there's a divorce? And unfortunately, over 50% of people's marriages end in divorce. Right, right. So we have to sometimes plan ahead, even though it's a very happy occasion, sometimes we have to think about the worst case scenario and that's what we try to help people do and that's where we're going to keep going on this program we need from you to share with our audience some key things yes everybody gets married you're saying and you walk down the aisle and it's going to be roses forever yeah two years five years and sometimes 25 and 30 years later that world falls apart doesn't always happen and you know and it happens more than 50 percent of the time so there's a few things for seniors you know uh, that you know maybe widowed or have been divorced and have grandchildren, you should know that in New York State, you're not guaranteed grandparent visitation. You know, at most, you may, if you ever have to go to court to try and enforce your visitation, let's say, you know, your son or daughter, uh, you know, either moves away or, is, or passes away and you have to right. deal with your former son or daughter-in-law, to get grandparent visitation isn't necessarily guaranteed. There should be a, a relationship that's already been established over a period of time. Um, for seniors that may be getting married a second or even a third time, right. they should know that uh, there's a lot of things you can do to protect your assets for your children and your grandchildren. You can have a prenuptial agreement that protects your assets. In New York, if you're married as a matter of law, uh, you can't write someone out of your will absent an agreement beforehand. So you can have a prenup that says, What's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, and I can leave whatever I have to my children and grandchildren and leave you out of my will, possibly. Right, okay. And then, the, so there's that issue, then there's the issue of, of, of Social Security. So if you're married later in life, or uh, you should know that you have to be married at least 10 years to participate in your spouse's Social Security benefits should they predecease you. So there's a lot of there's a lot of components right, okay. that seniors need to be, consider uh, when in terms of like the family law, whether they're leaving a gift, getting remarried, uh, prenups, even a postnuptial agreement. You can you can also have an agreement after you after you get married. Okay. Yeah, it's called a postnuptial agreement. It's not too common though, is it? Not as common, no. Uh, but generally speaking, you see more prenups than you do postnups. Right. So the question is about the 10-year period in Social Security. Does that apply for pensions as well, or just Social Security? Are there any like laws in the state of New York where someone can or cannot 
um, get someone's pension if they're going through a divorce based on how many years they're married? Well, it's not based on how many years you're married. It's, a ba it's based on the pension contributions during your marriage. Oh. So if you have a job, you work for 10 years, then you get married, and you work another 10 years, it's only the 10 years that, are ma that you're married and the pension contributions that you make to that pension during that period of time that are marital. And we have experts that we okay. hire to determine what was the value on the day you got married, what's the value today on the date of the commencement of the divorce, so what would the marital portion be? Mm -hmm. And in and, and a divorce, we do what's called a qualified domestic relations order. A judge would order that the marital portion that's, of that- That's the quadros. The quadros, right. that, it be, that it be divided. With that court order, the, the, the marital portion that the, uh, the non-pension spouse is entitled to would be separated without a taxable event. And when the, the employee retires, then their ex-spouse would get her share of whatever the, the marital portion of the pension is at that time. Okay. And they retire. That. So pre-marriage, whatever I, my pension is mine, that doesn't go into it. It is, but, when, but at the same time, you need to remember that when you do get divorced, if you do get divorced and you have a pension, um, some pensions require you to have the permission of your spouse if you're married, okay. and you, there may be some, uh, some qualifications on how you can take your pension. You may have to mm -hmm. you know, have a right of survivorship. You may have to purchase oh, okay. an annuity. Everything's different. Every, yeah, that's contract specific with the employer. Yeah. But, but you, you would most likely have to ensure your ex-spouse's portion of the pension should you predecease okay. your spouse. Okay. That's amazing. What happens in, in safeguarding children? In terms of a divorce, now you're, here's where I'm looking at. You're a divorced woman, I know, and you, it could be for a man too, so it's either way. And you're 55 years old, but now you meet somebody and you're going to try it again. Okay? But there's two or three children involved. Here's where I have an issue because now you can't, in fact, it was just recent, I, I read someplace where they, somebody got remarried um, and the new spouse died, the, the woman died, yeah. and everything wound up in the husband's name and he wants no part of the kids. Her kids. Well, it depends on whether or not they're minors, if they've been emancipated over the age of 21. Oh, okay. okay. It could be a, a woman and a woman, by the way, John, or a man uh, yeah, and a man. Yeah, right. You know, some of my most bitter divorces were two women who wear the same shoe size fighting over shoes. They had a $100,000 shoe collection. This no. is 10 years ago. I hope my daughter doesn't watch this show because I, it's, you're not allowed to have $100,000 worth of shoes. $100,000 worth of shoes that were the same shoe size. Could you imagine what that fight? That was the, one of the biggest wow. fights I've ever gotten into. And uh, I learned more about Louis Vuitton, Jimmy Choo, and Chanel than you would want. <laughs> No. But it, That'll but, be a show. We'll have to do yeah. a show. Hundred thousand dollars. Last time I heard that was Melda Marcos. And that was, that was a long time ago. That, this is two thousand nine, and they had handbags and scarves. So you know, in terms of protecting your children, you know, if you are remarried, right. you know, uh, unless there's a second parent adoption, that that new spouse does has no has has no obligation to these children. Presumably, that you know that the children, the former spouse right. or okay. the parent okay. of that okay. child, would be responsible for. Uh, for child care, child support, or, and, and actually would, would get custody of the kids if they were, you know, they were splitting time between two parents. Right, right, right. So also, if you do remarry and you're getting maintenance, so if you're getting what's formerly known as alimony, maintenance, there are a lot of cohabitation clauses and agreements and judgments. So if you're getting maintenance, and you remarry or you live with someone or have the same economic interest and you have share and you operate as a, as an economic unit your maintenance may stop it may end so you, you should really make sure before you cohabitate or live with somebody or get remarried if you're getting maintenance how that could affect your maintenance it could also affect your child support if you're the custodial parent you're getting child support and you marry someone who's a millionaire who's now paying for your shelter your house right, okay, and your okay. bills and the food then you know, there could be a recalculation of child support at that point mm -hmm. because you don't have the same needs that you did before. So there's a lot that goes into not just marrying somebody, but cohabitating with them or operating as one economic unit that you have to consider a along a litany of issues. You know, that's the purpose of a program like this. You just said something I never even paid attention to, cohabitating. I knew that if you get remarried, things can go a change, obviously, yeah. because now cohabitating never thought of I'm figuring that's fine but that could change things and even as a step parent if if you have a minor child uh, social services could go after you to pay for uh, certain things that uh, under the law even though that even though this child is in yours as a step parent who lives with this child right, right, you right, could right. be forced to pay for certain expenses so you know even like e even certain expenses related to like juvenile detention and other issues a step parent could be on the hook for that so there's a lot 
that is at stake when you're when two uh, people get married and they either have children of their own or right, a blended right, right. family, even if they're adults with rights of survivorship and rights of election with you know what you leave to someone in your will, are you going to leave them something in your will? You know, you don't if 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 you can't leave your spouse out of your will in New York state. Right. right? They can no, elect no, no. either what whatever's in the will or a third of the estate whichever is greater. And if you want to protect your estate for your kids, you need to consider that. You should probably have a formal writing before you get married that says, I'm going to be able to leave everything that I have to, to my children, and you can do the same. That's the point of a program like this, because, you know, nobody's thinking of this when they're 25 or 30 getting married. But when you're remarrying at the age of, and even not even remarrying, you're getting married at the age of 55, 60, 65, you have certain things already set in life. Even if it's a niece that you promised you would take care of, that has to be in writing before you marry, even for the first time, because if I get married to a man or a woman and something happens to me, they have no obligation to take care of their niece that I promised I would take care of. Most of the prenups that we're working on right now are for older people right. in their second or third marriage are trying to preserve assets. You know, the very few, I just did one with, it was a, a younger couple, and the gentleman had a, a vast amount of family wealth, and my client, the, the wife, the, the new wife, didn't, and she had a million dollar engagement ring. And she said, should I sign this prenup? I said, as soon as you get married, that million dollar engagement ring is yours. So right, right, right. <laughs> you sign it and get married <laughs> because you're a millionaire on day one. But that's, that's a very rare instance. Right now we're trying to protect people's rights who have already gone through a divorce or who are older and are widowed right, right, and want right. to protect their assets. I have a question about that, and I should know this, but I don't. Is, is, is New York State any type of... Uh, I think it's called common law, where if two people are together a certain amount of time, then, then it's almost as if they were married, like property becomes each other's or not at all. No, there are some there are some states where if you hold yourself out as married, you're considered married. Right. And if you do that, if you go to a state, like I believe it's either North or South Carolina, one of, one of the southern states, if you hold yourself out as married, then you're married. It's a common law state. Then right. New York would recognize that marriage. But that, you not would have, in New York, though. But, not, but in New York, you know, you can say you're married to someone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're married. A cohabitation with someone for a period of time doesn't matter. It means nothing. It means nothing. That's why, you know, that's why before uh, same-sex marriage was legal and domestic partnerships were legal, you know, they, we, had very, uh, we had a very difficult time protecting people's rights right, right. over a period of time. You know, like you could be with someone for your entire life, and they predecease you, the house is in their name, and now their family gets it, and you're out on the street. And we would have to make sure we would draft documents to protect both parties in that regard. Mm -hmm. You know, that was you, almost like a business document, though. Unfortunately, it was. It was. Right. You know, and even with same-sex marriage now, we still need second-parent adoptions, because uh, if you go to another country, you know, Dominican Republic does not recognize same-sex marriage or same-sex parentage, and if you know your partner goes to the DR with your kids and something happens, they're not going to recognize you as those children's parent. Right, right, you're you know, only the one. Absent a court order or, or a formal adoption. So we are always, we, even with same-sex marriage today, even with, you know, even with the Supreme Court upholding same-sex marriage, we're still advising parents in same-sex marriages to have a second parent adoption so you can lock in your rights, God forbid, you go, you figure you're going to Jamaica, the Bahamas, Dominican Republic. Yeah. A lot of these countries don't recognize it. So you have to be very, very careful. That's, That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that, just that fact alone. I mean, programs like this are so important because it's impossible for everybody to know everything. And I have yeah. a, a bunch of gay friends that have adopted, and I have no idea. If, I know they've only adopted in one name. Um, I have no idea if they've ever gone through paperwork to do a, a, a second adoption. I'm sure some of, your, some, some of the people watching this uh, in, in your audience either have this problem themselves or they have kids uh, uh, who are in same-sex marriages or same-sex relationships right. with children. You could be on that child's birth certificate and, you know, even though you're Never not the birth parent, yeah. but you may not have the same rights if you step outside of the state of New York and you got to be really, really careful about that. Wow. You know, it's also helpful uh, for, you know, if, for your audience, if, you know, that th those of you that are grandparents that, you know, if you can set forth like a, a sp you know a, a time that you usually see your grandkids and do it regularly, and even if you if God forbid something will happen to your child, and you know you still want to see your grandchild, ask them to make a provision for that in their will. You know, it's not going to necessarily control, but a judge could look at that to see what you know what your wishes were with your children vis-a-vis uh, -vis their grandparents and having right, access right, right. to the grandparents if something were to happen to you. So that's very important as well, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of that these days. A lot of grandparents who, uh, who are either, uh, you know, whose children predecease them or move away or incarcerated or some other tragedy happens, and they want to have access to their grandchildren, and they're routinely denied because, 
you don't have an absolute right to grandparent visitation in New York State. Now, a question: If if you put it, uh, if <clears throat> both parties, both parents, have to put in the will a grandparent visitation, or just the sibling? Uh, not the sibling, the, the child of the grandparent. Well, it helps if they both do. Right. You know, it also helps that, you know, if that were to happen, it did go to court, there would be an attorney appointed for the grandchild, and the grandchild wishes, their wishes would be taken into account okay. also. Okay. So grandparents out there, make sure you're nice to your grandkids, because yeah, you want no. them to tell the judge that they want to see grandma and grandpa, and that makes all the difference in the world. Because the law in New York has also changed. You know, the attorney for the children used to substitute their judgment for the kids and say, well, this is what I should think I think should happen in this particular case. This is who I think should get custody. This is, should, this is who should get parenting or grandparenting time. But now, if a child's old enough to really voice their wishes in a coherent way, then they have a say in what happens in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the attorney for the child's job, you know, really, ethically, is to tell the judge what his client's wishes are, what that child's wishes are. And if a child says, I want to see, you know, my grandparents or I want to see grandma and grandpa every Sunday, that has a, a, a dramatic impact and a profound impact on the way that case could be decided. Amazing. We have clients where <clears throat> they've gone into situations where grandparents are, it's, it's sad. It's sad. It really is. It's like, it's such an important part of their life, grandparent, parent, cousins, uncles, whatever, um, that are restricted to a half hour a week at this point. Um, and there's many like that. So I, I didn't realize you could put something in a will, God forbid, that I would, you know, it's not deceased my wife. It's not controlling, and a judge doesn't but have it to. Helps. But it is helpful to know what someone's wishes were. You know, right. Especially, you know, if, if some, God forbid, you know you have a terminal illness or something's going to happen, it's, it's close in time to when that, that particular the parent passes, and, the, and it's, it makes it a lot easier. But, again, having an established relationship with your grandchildren, uh, having them, you know, want to see you right, in that right. regard, that's really, that's really the most important thing. And we're actually seeing a lot of grandparents right now who are acting as parents. Who you know we see kids who have uh, who have you know with the opi opioid crisis right, and with right. addiction and other issues that or in the military you know and you're seeing grandparents act more as parents and you're mm -hmm. seeing you know some grandparents actually adopting their grandchildren wow. so they can have more formalized relationships and visitation and rights uh, to them as well. So there's you know and, and we're seeing a lot of that on Long Island and you know look it's so expensive to live on Long Island. So many people are still living at home with their parents. Okay. Very often, you know, the grandparents home is what's used for school district. Right? So you know, right, you, right, you know right, right, you, right. Kids right. can't afford, the, you know, the taxes are very high. Mm -hmm. The new tax law is going to be killing us here on Long Island. You see, when I, when I drive around through the mm -hmm. neighborhoods in the morning, wherever I am, sometimes you're looking at the bus stop, you see a lot of grandparents yeah. with the yeah. kids at the bus stop. It's, it's common. Um, I actually got a question, just to go back for, for a second with um, prenups and whatnot. Have you experienced, <coughs> or have you seen any second marriages where someone's getting scammed and the marriage is just being used for a scam to take someone for their money? And if so, is there anything that you could recommend to prevent it or warning signs maybe? Look, you know, if, if you have assets that you want to protect and, you know, obviously you think you're falling in love and it's, a, it, you know, everything's, you know, you know, unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it isn't always that way, and we know that. So you may want to broach a subject with your partner or the person you're engaged to, and say, "Look, I think we should have something that formalizes our financial arrangement going forward." You know, and and I think your first clue should be if there's resistance to that, or if someone doesn't want to sign. You know, so right. you know we have to keep in mind in those agreements, we also want to make sure that they're not under duress. So right. that particular person should, you know, should say, "Look, you know." You should have an attorney yourself. Have your attorney look at this. I'll, maybe I'll pay for your attorney. And there should be plenty of time before the wedding. There should be a few weeks where that person, the other person can meet with their attorney and go through it. Right. Especially if there's a different language or a foreign language, you want to make sure that the other person uh, has an attorney or a paralegal that can you know, recite the agreement back to them in Spanish. You know, Spanish is my first language. Okay. We have a lot of clients that we're doing prenups with who, are, who speak Spanish. We're able to sit down with them and tell them in Spanish exactly you know, what the agreement says. The agreement says that I'm their lawyer, that I've explained it to them, that I've, I've spoken to them and, and explained it to them in Spanish, which makes it a little bit, you know, a, a little bit stronger of an agreement and tougher to break or have thrown out in court. Uh, these agreements aren't, you know, they have to, there has to be a little bit of a give and take. They can't right, be right. so onerous and so unconscionable. Uh, and a good attorney will make a, a, prenup, a, a prenuptial agreement stand up in court by, you know, you give a little bit or, you know, or, or you, you establish exactly what your assets are. If you have a house, if you have multiple mm -hmm. houses, maybe you include an appraisal, 
you know, if you have a business, how long you've owned the business, and a, you know, you may, you may or may not want the business appraised depending on how much it costs. But you set forth in the agreement. Try to be as, as specific as specific as, as possible. possible. And, what if, you're saying. and if the person that, that you're marrying has made no contribution, make that clear. If you have a business, you know, my, my my potential spouse has never worked in it, has never done anything for it, has never lent us money. Uh, these are my properties. My potential spouse has never paid any money towards it, or given it. You need to really set these things out right. very clearly in these agreements. Mm -hmm. So someone getting married later in life really needs to consider this because you know you have limit you have limited. Uh, you know, you have limited funds, you have limited assets, you want to make sure that you preserve them both for yourself and potentially for your heirs, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you want to have, a, like, a happy relationship. And so it's a very fine line sometimes, but it's the best thing for It's, it's a fine line, but I think, I mean, I'm not there, I think at the end of the day, if you were coming into a relationship and I'm 55 or 60 and it's, it's love, but I happen to have millions of dollars and my partner, whoever it's going to be, doesn't, there's nothing wrong. It's like, if we care for each other, you shouldn't be wanting me for my money. Exactly. I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to make sure, God forbid I die, you'll have a house and you'll have an yeah. income for the rest of your life. I'm not going to put you on the street. That's the way it should be. That's right. the way it would be nice but to be. But my nice children like will have what they're going to have. Right. Plus, you have, you know, the other consideration is you're getting married, you're older in life, you have a business, you have business partners. That's true, too. Right? And your business partners don't want to go through your divorce with you. And I recommend this not just for older people, but for everybody that may be in a business with partners, that they consider what would happen if they got divorced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and make provisions for that in a prenuptial agreement or, or postnuptial agreement and set out that the business is separate and because your partners are not going to want to. It's, it's a very expensive that's a thing really good to point. do yeah. is to do a you know an audit and a financial analysis and appraisal of a business. It, it, it's wow, very I'm onerous. Not even that part of it. Yeah, that's the truth. Not to mention the tax consequences, or if there's something's discovered that you know you wrote something off you shouldn't have, and it comes up in court. Now yeah, the judge, because, yeah, now you're, you're digging, digging into everything. And the judge has to report be. it to the to the IRS if it comes out. In, right, in once something court. becomes public, it's public. So it's it's usually better just to make things a lot easier down the road. I mean, people that don't take these steps or that commingle assets, you know, before they're married, they make it much more difficult down the road and, right. and, the, and the attorneys just end up getting paid a lot more money. I agree. And the thing is, you're saying it's 50 percent. It's not, you know, if it happened one out of every hundred, yeah. yeah, listen, we're not going to get crazy. It's way too common. Yeah, nowadays it does make sense. So somebody like you, and not unfortunately, it's wonderful that they have an, ad, an ad advocate like you for them. But you're busy because this is reality of the world today. Yeah, but people are getting married. You know, they're getting divorced younger. They're getting married well, later. They're getting married later. They, you know, they have more assets. As you know, both people are working. You know, what's it? it you know, you can't in a prenup. You can't address like child support or right. or child custody if you were to have a prospective child, or uh, because the children have their own rights once they're born to, to support. You can't. But in terms of maintenance and oh, okay, distribution okay. of assets and stuff like that, you can set that forth and you can put an agreement like you know. You have a career, I have a career, we're both self-supporting, so neither one of us would need alimony or maintenance. If right, we were right, to get right. divorced, you would put that in the agreement as well. And what your educational background is, and what you do for a living, and how long you've done it, and set forth the reasons why you're self-supporting. You know, the right. more clear and the more detailed an agreement is, the more likely it is to be held up, to, to hold up in court. Yeah, you, you do prenups as well. <coughs> to be respected. Uh, well, yeah, we draft them and we right. get them thrown out of court also. <laughs> <laughs> You're honest. You know, I've been on both sides of this, right. you know. No, I'm sure. It's, have, not, it's not easy. And have you seen any examples <clears throat> like, like seniors, like, have done unscrupulous things containing, pertaining to marriage? Yeah, have you seen it, like someone's going after someone to get married and they know that you know it's just for the money? Look, sometimes we have uh, seniors sure have that, do, that do something that is could, it's unscrupulous, but they tr for the right reasons. You know, they have right. uh, you know, someone that they care about or a friend that is, not in this, is undocumented and they want to help Get oh, okay, a green okay. card. Oh, okay, okay. You know, and in those cases, That's we want to make right, sure right. different, we do. You know, we set forth all of the financial arrangements ahead right, of time. Right, right. You know, and, and and they're trying. They're getting married because they want to help somebody. I get you. And they end up, you know, having a major divorce battle. You know, after the fact, and you know, you want to be careful with that too, because yeah. you know, you don't want to, you don't want to admit I'm just in open court that you were trying to defraud the federal government. Also, right, right, yeah. so so that's a, de a, a, a prenup that's going to be right. I'm just wondering if you've seen any like act, like <clears throat> that's a plain example of a criminal act. 
people just, you know, plain out marry for money and then get divorced in two months or something. I'm sure there is. There has to be somebody. I in guess. It. Yeah, there is. You know, but you know, again, they think it, it's love. The woman. I, I go back to the woman. I shouldn't do that. But you know, the woman thinks this is the guy for me. Meanwhile, she's sitting on twenty million dollars, yeah. and he doesn't have anything. Believe it or not, we're doing more uh, second marriage prenups for men, right? Oh, <laughs> we're yeah, getting well, married okay. with assets than women. Uh, but you know, it, it, there's a lot that goes into a marriage. You know, you can't just be married for, for a few months and then and then have be entitled to half of someone's. Right. You know, assets. You know, what's your contribution? What was accumulated during the marriage? There are there are questions that have to be asked and answered. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. See, I, I get married to a multi multi millionaire, and then three months later, I'm saying I'm out of here. That doesn't account. Give me. Uh, the prerogative to get go after a big deal of the money. Right. No. No. I mean, unless oh. unless be through her, like you know, if she had passive a, a investments and in, in accounts or mutual funds, and they just because of market forces went up in value, you're not necessarily entitled to that. But okay. something through your direct efforts or her direct efforts that results in income, like right, you go to right, work right. every day, every dollar you make after you're married, you know, is is you know 50 50. Right. So that's different. Okay. In your situation, she may have actually lost money, and you've made right, money, right, 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 and right. you end up having to pay her. Pay okay. her, even though she's okay. a millionaire, but it's separate property, you know. So, you know, there are things that are inherently separate property. Okay. Um, yeah, even when you get married, even if you're married, if you get an inheritance just to yourself, that's separate property. Right. Or a personal injury or disability award while you're married is separate property. So, Unless you put it into the joint account, right? You got to keep it separate. Yeah, you, sh you should keep it separate. So okay. that's what you know. It, it, that's why people should know. Like, if they inherit something, you should have a separate. They should have a separate account. Even it, what's even more helpful to, if it's at a separate bank than you, you normally bank with. We've been so, through this. So, okay. so, it's, so they're not yeah, connected yeah, accounts, yeah. and then and it's just in their you know in, in, right. in the spouse's one in your own name or a personal injury or just in your name. Also, whatever you bring into a marriage can be considered separate property. Right. So if you owned your house before you got married and you get married, it's not all of a sudden marital. Right. And another thing that your audience may want to be very careful about is giving gifts to their children or grandchildren who are getting married. If your child, if your son or grandson uh, is getting married and you want to give them a gift to help them buy a house, a substantial gift, you should write a gift letter specifically to your son or grandson in this case with setting out the amount. You should, you know, if you have to file a gift tax return, you should do that. Uh, even if while they're married, you, you make that gift. That gift would be separate property. Wow. So, and but you have to make sure that you know you take that gift, you put it right in, you put it into an account. From that account, it goes right into the house. We can trace it back. I never knew that about gifting. So I, I figured it's just common property. Well, no, if you, if, if you gift it to the one person, that's directly. very important for grandparents right, right, right. to know that. Very important. So yeah. you know, so some banks want to see a gift to both parties that are going to be applying for the mortgage. In that case, you may want to just gift it to. You know your your son or grandson in this case, and have them put into a separate account, and have them have the bank see it there. But there are certain steps that you can take to protect your money that you want to gift, and make sure that it stays, you know, in the family. Wow. That's, That's great. It's amazing, Dave. I'm I'm sure I could come up with a lot more questions, but we're running out of time. So I want to thank you for being here, and uh, on behalf of myself and John Ryan, I'd like to thank you for watching another episode of Project Safe. And of course, I want to thank Dave Mejia's matrimonial attorney. And what Project SAFE is, is Seniors Against Financial Exploitation. We put this together to help uh, teach seniors, retirees, and adult children how to protect these people from scams and financial exploitation. If you would like us to come out and present at any one of your groups, uh, civic association, friends group, church, synagogue, just give us a call at 516-719-6396. Thank you very much. Thank you.